This is the Powered Up Podcast, show 99. They begin to feel like this is my classroom. It's not just Dr. Miles's classroom, but it's it's my classroom, and that's that's my place uh, at school. And so they begin to take a lot of ownership and pride in what's going on in the classroom, and that tends to spill over into uh, pride and ownership of the actual learning. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Ken Erman, host of the Power to Podcast, and I am here with my co-host, Mr. Matt. You have the power to decide, Rogers. Matt, got a new background. It's it's looking beautiful. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much. I'll have to point this out. You know, so my wife took, you know, 99 some episodes of checking our, you know, videos. And she's like, you should really change this background. You should really change this background. You know, you really need to add stuff to it. So what did we do this weekend? We went, we bought all sorts of things that I don't know if we really needed, but while we were out, we got a few things to add to the back wall. So hopefully it looks a little bit nicer, um, but you know, it took long enough. We've been, we've been doing this podcast a long time now, um, but tonight kind of was a great, you know, last in the, the zero through 99 realm podcast uh, number for sure. So. Yeah, I had I had an absolute blast that I, I thought our guest was phenomenal. It was a conversation that, you know, is line is in line with my own personal passions, but I felt like it was a conversation that is beneficial to the teachers K twelve. Um, I think we had a little bit more of an elementary focus in our remarks just because all three of us were elementary teachers. But the topic of choice and decision making in your classroom and and putting that on, onto the students' shoulders and responsibilities is obviously applicable to any grade level that you teach. Um, it was, I, I just think it was really rich and we really niched down and, and hyper-focused on that idea. But, you know, it's kind of like when we think about our classroom, do you want to skim the surface across every unit or do you want to, do you want to dive deep and make sure the students thoroughly understand a, a topic or idea? And I think we did that tonight. I totally agree. And Ken, I know we got off the, the, conversation and kind of felt like, you know, this is almost like a traditional uh, podcast for us, while also almost sounding like our summer series where we really zoned in on a specific topic and, and answered some questions. It was nice to to have both of your feedback. And, um, you know, what I think was really neat about it is Dr. Miles kind of talks from one perspective that is distinctly different, even though it's in the same, you know, general topic as yours, that spectrum can be wide, even if you feel like, you know, student centered learning or PBL is a niche thing, or, you know, a, a narrow, only a few teachers take it on, there can be many interpretations of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think that she provided great ideas, great specific examples. Um, and a lot, a lot of good back and forth where we had similar goals, but our, our process and, and the way that we operated our classroom was a, was a little bit different. So let's not delay any further. Let's hear from Teach Better Network, and then let's jump right into that interview with Nancy Miles. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcasts. Now let's get back to the episode. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing tonight? Hey, I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So I'm really excited to jump into this conversation. So Nancy and I were chatting before we recorded here, and I knew she was recommended 
uh, by a former guest. I was, I was, I was struggling to recollect who it was, but it was Morgan Rankin who we had on. Uh, I recorded with her over the summer, Matt. I actually think that was one of our very few conversations that you missed out on. Um, so, uh, Morgan is Tennessee teacher of the year and she raved about you, Nancy. So I'm excited to, to sit down and have a conversation with you tonight. So to kick things off, officially introduce yourself. Uh, let us know where you are coming from and just kind of give us a snapshot of what your career in education has looked like. Okay. This will be my elevator talk. <laughs> so uh, education is actually my second career. I have a degree uh, from LSU in marketing and I spent some time in the business world. And then I had a couple, uh, my two children and decided to go into education. So I, because I loved volunteering in the classroom. So I went back and got my master's. And since I've gotten my uh educational, uh, I've gotten my doctoral uh, level PhD in educational leadership. So once I jumped into education, I started, uh, I've always been in elementary school. I started in uh, here in Johnson City, Tennessee in a multi-age class, and that was kindergarten, first and second grade kids. And it was fabulous because it truly taught me that children come into school at all different levels. I would have kindergartners come in who were reading and I might have a second grader who still couldn't read but a handful of words. So it was a great experience in terms of helping me really understand where children, that you need to meet children where they are <clears throat> in terms of as a learner, their style and what they, you know, the experiences that they come with. And so through the years, I've taught for 20, almost uh, 21 years and I've, moved up a grade every few years. So I went to, uh, once the multi-age program was over, I went to third grade for seven or eight years. I went to fourth grade for four years and this year's my first year in fifth grade. So I just keep getting promoted <laughs> up through the elementary and our schools in uh, Johnson city are K through five, pre-K through five. So I've made my way up through the elementary level. Yeah, that's that's funny. Um, so I, I started as a fifth grade teacher for a bulk of my career, and now I'm a secondary instructional coach. So whenever I run into students, I, I've been doing it for a few years now, so this happens less. But when I first started, and they were seeing me in the high school, you know, it's like, Mr. Irvin, what are you doing here? And I would always joke, Oh, I finally graduated fifth grade, and I was able to make it to to middle school and high school. So you're slowly working yeah. towards that elementary graduation. Um, so for our listeners that have uh, heard many of our shows. Uh, I've asked this question multiple times, but it's one of my favorite questions when we have a guest on that didn't start in education because most teachers leave public ed, go to college, and then go right back into public ed. And so what I'd love to hear from you is what do you think you learned during your time in your career in marketing and just being out in the business world that any and even as a mom during that time before jumping back into education, what do you think you learned from those experiences outside of education that have had a direct impact on the way you teach or the way you uh, the way you function in your classroom? Um, a couple of things. One uh, immediately that comes to mind is relationships. You know, when you're in sales and when you're in marketing, you have a product that probably who you're selling to could get you know, any number of places. And the reason people choose to do business with you is because of the relationship they have either with you personally, uh, through the company, or um, how you relate and how you understand what their needs are and how you fulfill those needs, whether it's through conversation or whether it's actually through product development. And so I think just building those relationships and listening to the needs of the person that you're working with is very important and that you respond to that. And so I've been able to really transfer that into the classroom to listen, not only to what the students are saying and what they're showing me they can do, but what they're not doing either. Um, you also have to build relationships with parents because that's your number one uh, team player. You know, they the parents are the first teacher uh, of, of their child, they, you know, that's their number one priority as well. They want their children to succeed. I've never, ever had a parent that said, you know, uh, I know my child can't do this. They're always encouraging. They want uh, their child to succeed. Sometimes they don't always know what to do at home. And so, you know, you build that relationship and help them understand um, how you can work together. So you've got to have those positive relationships 
Uh, the other thing is, I think you uh, children need to believe in themselves and uh, take some risk. And that's one thing that I'm really passionate about is that students feel okay in the classroom to be wrong. Um, I spend a lot of time making sure that they understand that it's okay to make a mistake, that we're, you know, nobody's going to put them down. They need to be a risk taker in terms of trying something, even though they don't really know what their next steps might be. And so that they just, they feel good about themselves. So, you know, that's just building relationships and feeling safe where you are uh, to, to make mistakes, I think are two big things that I learned. So I think, you know, hearing those, it's interesting. I, I feel like, Ken, we've heard similar uh, responses from teachers that, you know, as you were mentioning, career-wise, uh, from beginning to end, as well as what you're sharing, Nancy. And I think um, the the kind of customer type perspective of, of that relationship and that interaction being so dependent on, you know, the success and in the classroom, that is uh, obviously key. I know for me right now, I'm spending so much time at this time of year, you know, reminding kids that, you know, all the work we've established throughout the beginning of the year is leading towards, you know, the weather's getting poorer and, you know, uh, our attention spans might be a little less because we're excited, at least in the Northeast, towards snow and holidays, these different features. But we're kind of depending on that give and take relationship between you as the facilitator and the kids as well. So kind of using your spectrum, what were some of the strategies you used similar to younger grades when you first started? to what you are teaching now with the slightly older elementary? And what are some of the major changes between how you interacted and developed those relationships with the youngers and the, the older learners? So um, building relationships comes in different forms and just depending on the age group of child, you've got different approaches. So one of the strategies that have worked uh, just across the board, no matter what age child that uh, I've had in my classroom is just getting to know what they like, you know, whether it's something they like to pack for lunch or something they like to play after school, or is it a game they like to play? You know, some of the fifth graders that I teach right now are still big into Pokemon cards. Uh, they like to uh, play soccer. I want to know who the big soccer players are. So I try to, you know, kind of step into their world and find out, you know, what it is that they get excited about. Sometimes I have to dig a little more. You have a shy student that you have to, you know, have a little more conversation with. Um, I play games with them. I try to go as much as I can. I can't do it as, as much um, now that I've gotten more and more commitments with my career, but I like to go, you know, to their soccer game. I like to go to a dance recital. Um, we have a girls on the run team at our school and I will uh, go to their 5k is this Saturday. So I want to go and cheer them on. So I, I try to build those relationships by becoming part, a little bit a part of their world. Um, and I also do the same thing with parents. You know, I try really hard the first few weeks of school to make that positive phone call home so that, um, you know, the parent, parents always want to know, how are my child, how's my child doing in school? Are they making friends? Do they like fifth grade? You know, how are they doing adjusting from summer schedule to school schedule? So I always try to make a, a phone call just to let them know how things are going and just to begin to open up those lines of communication because, if I start on a positive note that way, if they have a concern, I feel like that they would be more likely to initiate a phone call. And and if I have something that I need to share with them in terms of, hey, I need some help with this, um, it's we've already started out on a, on a positive note. So, you know, there's nothing problem wise in a classroom, I think that you can't overcome, but you definitely need to be a team, whether it's working with another teacher or working with a parent and the child needs to know that you're on, that you're on their side. You're not against them. You're for them. You're just trying to find ways to, uh, to help them make connections and help them find a, their best learning path. So related to getting to know the students, which is something so simple to say, but it's also, I think, one of the most important things that's said on this podcast so often. 
how do you or do you have any tips for new teachers or even veteran teachers on how to make sure you're legitimately doing that with all of your kids? So I can remember a moment, and I've shared this once on the podcast, that I, I will never forget that I was very ashamed to realize my, I think it was my second year. I don't think it was my first year of teaching. I looked at a student in the second week of school and realized I knew their name, but I did not have a personal interaction with that student yet. And it was just something that I felt terrible about, like not even just like a one-on-one -on -one good morning. I, I was very confident that had not happened. And I made sure that that never happened again after the first day of school. But something else that that has stuck with me is I had a student who came back and visited a few years after having me in fifth grade. And we were just kind of talking and, and having a, a pretty open conversation. And she said one of the things that she always appreciated about my classroom is she felt like I was one of the only teachers she ever had that didn't have any favorites. And I, I felt like that spoke, that, that really hit me because it made me feel good that other students or my students were recognizing that I was making an effort to get to know all of them in different ways, but I was getting, I was making an effort to get to know all of them. So do you have any tips for our teachers as you're making efforts to form these positive relationships in the back of your mind, you know, I'm doing this with all of my kids, not just the ones that are willing to share because they're outgoing extroverts, but how are you making sure that you are connecting with every student in your classroom in, in a positive and meaningful way? Well, you know, the biggest thing is time. And that's that comment that you made about that student said, I, I didn't feel like you had favorites. That tells me that you made sure that you spent some kind, some kind of quality time. It doesn't have to be a long time either, but, you know, making eye contact, talking directly to, to a child, you know, asking, asking them, um, you know, how did the soccer game go last night? Or, hey, I hear your little sister's been been sick. You know, how are you feeling? Um, I had lunch with a couple of girls today who I had last year in my fourth grade class that are in a different class this year. And we just really miss each other. And they saw me in the hall and they said, hey, Dr. Miles, can we have lunch sometime? I said, sure. So, you know, we spread a little picnic uh, blanket out on the floor and we just talked for a minute. We were maybe together, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, but just really, you know, having a conversation and letting them know that, uh, you know, that I want to know something that's going on in your life, in their life and, and asking questions. The other thing I do too is, um, I tell them about silly stuff that happens happens in my life too. So they get to know me as a teacher. I think that's important that they understand that you're more than just their math teacher, or just their science teacher, that you have a dog or that, you know, you got up late and you were, you were rushing to school today or you forgot your lunch, um, locked your keys in the car. I think they need to understand that you are a real person and not just that person they see in the classroom from eight to three. And I think, I think that legitimizes the relationship a lot of times that they recognize, hey, she can make mistakes and she's still okay. So she's accepting of me when I don't, when I come in in a bad mood or when I make a mistake in class, that they're, um, they're accepting me as I am. And I want them to accept me as I am as well. I love that, you know, even the example of you talking about having lunch with a former student uh, I know in my frame of mind right now, I'm thinking, you know, I am responsible for these 17 kids and I have enough time to say hi to my formal students. You know, if someone comes down the hall and they're looking upset, you know, I might pull them aside. But really, I feel like my responsibility is to my current students. Um, but, you know, as teachers, I am their fourth grade teacher. I will forever be their teacher. I care about them. And, you know, I, I want to support them going forward. So how do you kind of... Matt, before, before you go any further, I just want to make a real quick comment. What I think is neat about having lunch with former students is your current students might think like, hey, I want to have lunch with you, right? And then that'll spark them asking to stay in for lunch because they see you doing it with former students you had. Yeah, because they saw when when my other when my real class came back from lunch, those 
those couple of girls were still in there and they were like, what are they doing here? So, you know, it, you're right. I hadn't thought about that point, but that's interesting. And I've had, you know, at the end of um, one of the traditions here in our school system is uh, it's called senior tea. So that when students who are graduating from the high school, we just have one high school in our system. So when students are graduating the senior tea, they go back to their elementary school and that's one of my very favorite days because the students um, that I would have had, what, eight or nine years ago, make it a point to come up and say, hey, do you remember when such and such happened? Wasn't that funny? And it may be something I don't really remember, but I'll laugh along and say, yeah, that was great, you know, or gosh, I don't remember that. But they'll, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, don't you remember when we played octoball and so and so fell over the right, fell over the uh, side of the rail and he broke his arm. Remember how bent that was, you know, and they'll remember the craziest things. They will never tell me, Hey, remember that great test? How, how I, well I did on that. They won't remember that. They'll remember the fun things or the crazy things or the silly things that we did. And that tells me that it's all about the relationships and that's, what's important. So I don't know if you guys have had former students come back like that, just like high schoolers, you know, you think high schoolers, they don't care about who their third grade teacher or first grade teacher was, but you know, a lot of times they do. And it's nice to have them come back and tell you that because that's what keeps you going. I know I, I've mentioned a few times about uh, we're finally in the point of our career that, you know, when I go to the high school or high school, I recognize kids that I've had um, just because I've moved around a few times and, um, to be able to go, I, I find, I don't know if you feel this way. If I go to the middle school, they don't want to see me. If I go to the high school, uh, especially, you know, sophomores and up, you know, they're a little bit more interested in seeing Mr. Rogers and, and talking about that impact and, you know, rehashing. I actually have a former student currently who is, um, just joined our school staff, which is hilarious uh, in its own right as a para. And she is uh, very frequently telling me about the experience in fourth grade and what it meant to her. And, and that, that was kind of an overriding, uh, you know, ambition to, she saw that school could be fun and enjoyable and all those features. And I guess, you know, Ken, to, I, I know that we were kind of talking about, you know, what, that those next steps are. But we talked to a guest recently that talked about how you actually showing interest in other classmates, you don't necessarily have to go to it all. It just shows that you care about the class beyond just the time that you're at school. So, you know, Nancy and, and Ken, you know, I find that interesting. The thing I was going to point up is how do you balance, you know, the, the needs of former students wanting your attention, you know, current students wanting your attention, um, while also leaning into knowing that, you know, if you do some, it still portrays that message that you care. What happens? So, um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're a teacher, and I, and I know you guys probably feel this way too. You are a teacher, whether you're in the school building or not but you can't live your whole life 24 seven as a teacher with those kids. Cause you've got your own responsibility and your own family. So, you know, a lot of times I'll just help build those relationships by, you know, letting somebody in my classroom lead part of the lesson, uh, letting someone take responsibility for um, some of the initial activities that we do at the beginning of the classroom, for instance, uh, now that I'm in fifth grade and, you know, the kids are a little bit more responsible, they run our class meeting at the very beginning of the classroom. We spend probably not more than 10 or 12 minutes, uh, definitely not 15 because we're getting ready and we switch classes within about 20 minutes after we're there. But um, we talked about at the very beginning of the school year, you know, what are the kinds of things we need to do at the beginning of school? What does what does our classroom need to look like? So, you know, we need to take attendance. We need to do lunch count. We want to talk about how things are going. You know, hey, let's brag on somebody that did, made a good choice yesterday or was really kind to a friend. Or, you know, hey, we're having a having a problem getting our uh, materials organized. Or I noticed that somebody wasn't really kind to another person the other day. So we we have that 
class meeting. We call it a restorative circle where we talk about, you know, what's going good in the classroom, what's not. You know, we'll take polls. Like I know for sure our poll tomorrow is what do you like better, Pals or McDonald's? Well, Pals is like a regional uh, hamburger place here. And the children come up with that. We have a, a one girl who runs that class meeting. She comes up with the polls. You know, what are we going to ask each Wednesday? We do polls like that on Wednesdays. She um, she has designated a couple of kids to come up with a joke of the day. So pe kids are responsible for doing that. She has asked several. Oh, she has asked one to come up with um you know how there's always a holiday like National Pickle Day or National Hot Chocolate Day. So she has uh, assigned somebody to find out what that is. So they all, you know, have some kind of responsibility. And then we switch every once in a while who that classroom manager is. So, I mean, she really runs runs that meeting. So they, you know, the other thing that that is nice when you're teaching older children and younger children could do some of that, but they they begin to feel like this is my classroom. It's not just Dr. Miles's classroom, but it's it's my classroom and that's that's my place uh, at school. And so they begin to take a lot of ownership and pride in what's going on in the classroom. And that tends to spill over into uh, pride and ownership of the actual learning. And that's gotta be built first, that relationship and, and recognizing that this is my place has to come first. And so we work, early on in the school year, and I'm sure you all have done it too, um, in, in just making sure that kids feel comfortable there and that they uh, have relationships with one another. Because it's one thing for me to have a relationship with them and be positive, but they need to have those positive relationships too among themselves. You're speaking my language here, Nancy, because passing, uh, Matt, Matt knows all too well, passing as much ownership over to the students was was my bread and butter in terms of everything I, I did in my class, the way I operated from beginning to end when, so moving into fifth grade, where did you, where did you get the confidence or how did it develop in terms of starting to realize, Oh, I can pass that off. I can pass that off. You know, for me, it got to the point where I would look at every portion of my day and say, what am I doing that I don't have to do anymore? that my students are more than capable of doing. And you and you hit it, hit the nail on the head. It spills over into the learning. And that's really the whole, the whole reason behind it, other than the students having more pride in the classroom, feeling more ownership, doing all of those things. It actually has a direct impact on the success of your teaching and learning. But where did you get that confidence or how did you start to dish out ownership more and more, especially as you worked in the fifth grade classroom? Well, uh, before I answer that, I want the one word that was coming to mind is commitment. You know, they have that commitment to uh, uh, and pride in wanting to run that classroom meeting. So they have that commitment to, hey, let's make this fun. Let's take responsibility. So that commitment spills over to the learning. But I do think, um, I mean, some of it came from the kids. Some of the kids came to me and said, hey, can we run this class meeting? Or can we tell a joke each day? Or can we do this? And, you know, I was like, yeah, 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 y'all can do that. Um, and so, you know, we talked a little bit about what their ideas were and they got more excited when they realized that I was going to, you know, yeah, y'all go and run with it. So, you know, it wasn't always my idea to do it. It was them recognizing, hey, this is something we kind of want to do. Let's ask and find out. And as much as I can, I try to say yes, you know, within reason. You know, we can't just knock off and not have school all day long for all week. But, you know, could we take a quick little break? Could we do recess at a different time of day? Why not? You know, so I try to give them some leeway and help them feel feel responsible and have a little bit of um, uh, power. I try to empower them as much as I can. It also kind of allows you to turn your attention, you know, to a slightly different direction. You know, obviously there are, and Ken, you can, you've spoken about it a ton and it is a pursuit, Nancy, for me to get to a more student centered, uh, you know, commitment being your keyword. I am trying to work my way to being committed uh, to, to have these attributes. It's not necessarily how my classroom naturally runs right now. Um, and, and there's some things that, you know, Ken and I have talked about with scripted curriculum and, and just kind of those expectations and, and even teaching, you know, fourth to a fifth grader is a little bit different in their makeup and, and what they can handle 
I've yeah, been surprised. As, you know, independence, yeah. you know, I am dealing very much so mm-hmm. with the exiting of third grade behavior. We're recording this in November. And I walk by my classroom and, you know, I walk past the third grade classrooms and I see lots of similarities and I look down the hall to the fifth graders and they don't look like the same student. It doesn't look like a year's gap. It's a huge difference. Yeah, it really is. With that just kind of, you know, coming to mind, where do you feel like, you know, if you were to go back in to, you know, reverse order, how would you change kind of the the responsibility, the student-centered nature, the, you know, use kind of what you're saying, what would you expect and how would it be different for different age ranges that you've taught? Um, well, if I went, if I went back, even way back to kindergarten, you know, there's some social uh, things that those children need to learn. You know, how do you, how are you kind to one another? What does that look like? You know, you could do some role playing with that. How does it feel when someone hurts your feelings? How does it feel uh, when you don't get a turn? Because, you know, when you're five years old, you want to tell everything. You want to be first at everything. So, you know, talk about uh, how that feels, because I think those five year olds need to have the language to be able to express what they're feeling and what they're thinking. Um, And then again, just look at their talents and see, you know, here's a particular child that's good at organization. Maybe they could stack the blocks together uh, and uh, uh, incorporate other children to help them with that. Just look for those things that they're really good at and help them build some confidence. So, you know, small little things like that to help them um, take more ownership in the classroom. I think it's helpful. It, I'd have to think, I'd have to turn my mind back because it's been a while since I've taught a five-year-old, but you know, when you're as much leeway as you can give them for being responsible for their own materials or uh, even putting things away in the classroom or taking turns, I think is uh, sets the groundwork. And, and I would also add to that, you know, I, it's really hard when you're a grade level teacher to identify what normal behavior is for that grade level. And I think that's something I know um, Responsive Classroom has a book series called Milestones that talks about, you know, uh, the the kind of development and what you can expect of kids in each grade level. And I love every year before I have the kids come in, I read the expectations of nine year olds and 10 year olds. You know, where do we have to transition of, you know. One of the things that I, that sticks out in my mind is a ten year old loves to loves advocacy. They they don't have any clue what to be an advocate for, but they want to be an advocate. So you can kind of tap into that. And Ken, I'm sure you see that. You know, with fifth graders, you know, they want advocacy and they want to have an opinion and they want to do good genuinely. They don't necessarily know the direction. That's where you kind of step in and you provide that guidance. But I love that. And I think it's really hard for, you know, this is a new teacher. What is normal? What is expected? It could be a seasoned pro that's never taught a grade level before. Because at least I don't, I'm sure you've heard it. You know, these kids, these kids these days, you know, we always get this kind of comment, like these kids are acting way different than kids long ago. There are different features by all means, but um, I I think that's an overgeneralization of, you know, they're still developmentally very similar. They still, you know, enjoy very much those same type things, which again, is good for us to remember. I agree. And, yes, and, and to that point, Matt, even if it's not someone teaching a new grade level, it could be someone that's been teaching a grade level for a long, long time. And you kind of lose sight of what are these students actually capable of? If you're not relinquishing control, you're just operating under the assumption that they are not capable of doing that. You know, my, my own children right now are, are not in public school yet, but they go to a school for a couple days a week, a couple hours a week. And at back to school night, my son's teacher, so he's four, is talking about all the things that the kids do in the morning by themselves. And she kept saying like, yeah, you know, even if they don't do that at home, we're teaching them how to do that here. So they're encouraging our children to be more independent. And as parents, sometimes we just do it because it's easier. 
Let me just put your shoes on for you because it's easier. Let me just carry your backpack because it's easier. It's faster, it's faster. right? Right. Ex- We're on exactly. the schedule. We exactly. got to hurry up. So <laughs> math should have started a few minutes ago. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So relinquishing that control <laughs> will take longer in the beginning, but it pays dividends around this time of year. This is where rocket fuel is poured on because you've invested so much into those students and now they can, they can really hit everything at a sprint. And looking at those younger grade levels too, of, you know, how do we relinquish more control, even just giving them choice. Do you want to do this or that? Do you want to do this first or this second? Getting them to understand that they have the ability to make choices, I think is important versus at a fifth grade level, it might be, you have to do these five things, get them done, right? Whereas a, a, a first grader it might be, okay, well, first we're going to do this or that. But even at the fifth grade level, you have students that don't have strong executive functioning skills. So you do have to scaffold that just get all of these things done. So you know, I think it's all about understanding the students and their abilities, but also pushing them to pass those boundaries that you think are, are set there for them. So go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, and I love it when you were talking about the choice. I love it when you have a child in your classroom that you do give them that choice and they, they look at you and are like, oh, okay. you know, And they all of a sudden realize, hey, I've got a choice and you can almost see the empowerment, you know, and the pride of like, okay, you know, I'm going to do this first and then I'm going to do this. And they, that's where I see that ownership uh, taking place because I'm like, okay, I decided I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this. And so that, that's kind of fun to watch. That's almost as fun to watch as like when I taught first graders to read and all of a sudden they could read the words on the page and they could read a whole sentence. So, you know, it's a little bit different, but they're still, recognizing um, I've got some choice here, I'm empowered, I've got some say-so. And if you're a teacher that likes a lot of control in your classroom, that is so, so hard. You've got to be comfortable in your own skin, for sure. I'd I'd love to challenge both of you, you know, on this concept of, you know, student centered and and having choice, which I think we all agree with. And, and Nancy, you mentioned, like, if you love control, that's hard to give up. And that's hard to, you know, lean into. Um, We've learned in behavior management, and I I put it in quotes, I'll, I'll kind of preface that in a moment. We've learned in behavior management, whether you're the incorporation of students on the autistic autistic spectrum, you know, emotional support uh, services, learning support, that structure and, you know, almost consistency is so key, you know, that the kids kind of expect what's going to happen. You know, my classroom, if I were to talk about that behavior management, my behavior management really is as Ken will tell you, creating experiences that the kids love being a part of so that I don't really have to worry about behavior management. You know, that's my goal. If the kids are enthralled with what's going on, we don't have problems. And if most of those experiences are like that, then they're okay, you know, going through some, some of that basic paperwork or, you know, the have to do's to get to the, you know, how my classroom actually functions. So the question that I want to ask is, you know, my, my expectations are very firm. You know, you do right, you won't have any issues, you do wrong, then we're going to have an equivalent, you know, consequence for that. How do you feel like you can manage and keep in that same brain, I'm going to have consistency, but a ton of student choice. You know, I'm going to have a ton of control on, you know, if things are structured, you know, behaviorally, but I'm also going to kind of have freedom and flexibility when it comes to the instruction side. I can see that being a little bit challenging as you, you know, push into that realm. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to balance it. I mean, you, you've got to have one of the big things structure wise in my, in our classroom is, you know, our routine is the same. You come in, you put your materials up, you know, you're expected to get ready for the day and we have our class meeting. You know, within the class meeting, there's some choice of what the discussion is going to be about that day or who contributes. 
within, say, within a content area. So, for instance, in science that I was teaching today, you know, there's an expectation that you're going to have your journal. We're going to document some things that we're doing in our experiment, but we're going to have some class discussions and we're going to have some choice uh, within the experiment or the exploration itself, how that's going to be done. But in terms of the outcomes and what I expect children to produce, that is what is more structured. How we go about it sometimes is a little different. I think sometimes I would take an opposite approach <clears throat> where it's, I now I wouldn't do this in the beginning of the year, but as the year progresses, saying to students, I expect you to show me you understand this list of skills, or I expect you to show me you understand, um, you know, this uh, set of criteria and you have full reign of showing me how to do that and building on the choices that they have. So teaching them how to make a video, teaching them how to make a slideshow, teaching them how to make a book, even a physical book, digital book. So giving them them choices and then those are always permanent choices that they have in the classroom. And it's a very a specific criteria of the knowledge that they're supposed to showcase. Um, so, so kind of the reverse of that, that we might now the, the path might be similar to what you said too, Nancy, where they have kind of choice in, in that path to get there, but then giving them choice in the product, as long as they are hitting the criteria that I expect that shows me they understand the skill or they understand the knowledge that, that we're pursuing. Well, and the beauty of that too is once they understand what that product is, that could cross over right. into different content areas. So, yeah, that's to me, that's mm -hmm. working smarter. Well, and that's, you know, <laughs> for teachers that don't like to give up choice, I would say, do you like doing all the work yourself or do you like having other people share the responsibility? And, you know, I, I told my students first day of school, mm -hmm. you know, you may have heard that Mr. Ehrman's the fun teacher and I'm going to try to be the fun teacher. But I can guarantee you one thing, you're going to work harder in this classroom than any classroom you've ever worked in in your entire career in education or in, in school, because I'm going to make well, you work yeah. and hopefully they enjoy it. And, and I think they learn to enjoy it. And I think they, you know, like you said, they that pride of ownership that they have when they when when you when you give them those choices. And when you were saying about giving students choice the first time and they their kind of eyes light up like, really, like I get to choose. A comment yeah. I always used in my classroom when mm. students would say, hey, Mr. Ehrman, can I can I do this? And they were deliberately saying, like, can I go take a nap or they, they would say something that they know they're not supposed oh. to. And my response always was, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you have always have the freedom to make a choice, but just know there's a consequence. Your choices can have good consequences yeah. or bad consequences, but ultimately mm. you need to make your own decisions. Mm -hmm. And it would freeze them in their tracks. But when they hear that constantly, they start to learn that they are making decisions and they are making choices mm -hmm. in the classroom and in their lives and that it does have an impact. And ultimately, they do have the ability to always make that decision, whether they listen to the teacher or not, or whether they do the work they're supposed to, or what type of project they want to do. And, and when you I'm getting really amped up here because this is like one of my favorite things to talk about. When you start to give them the freedom to choose and you start to empower them to choose, then you can really challenge them on the choices they make. So with what I just said about mm -hmm. choose the product you want, I would then, you know, especially like the last third of the year, you need to tell me why you chose the, pro the product you chose. And it can't be because you like to write. It can't be because you like to make videos. You need to say, I chose this for this project because I think it will be the best product because. So then it was not choose what you're comfortable with, choose what makes the most sense for what we're doing and learning. And so mm -hmm. real again, another- I like that. Almost like- Exactly. Getting them to understand the reasoning mm -hmm. behind the choices we make. And it might not be the best choice or mm -hmm. it, they still might choose the one that they like, but come up with like a reason that that works and that's fine. But it, it's not about the decision they make. It's about the experience of making decisions and learning how to make decisions and the impact and the reasoning. And, you know, making choices is one of our most valuable skills as, as adults, you know, do we know how to make good decisions? Oh, yeah. and we don't allow our kids to learn that in a safe environment like school. Mm hmm. 
Well, and crossing over or back to what you were saying about consequences, that's to me, that's where school meets real life. They begin to see, okay, if I do this, it's going to result in this. It's, it's, and am I going to be happy? Am I going to be following through with what I know I'm responsible for? Or am I not? Am I going to have to start over and redo that? And that, I think that that part really helps them mature as an adult in the, the age group that we're teaching they are starting to recognize that much more so than, than the younger, younger students. And they can realize I've got some power over what happens to me in my life. And it all is dependent on the choices that I make. So to just kind of question, that's an important, I, I don't know if we want to keep on going down this rabbit hole, but I can keep on, you know, asking these questions really, I guess, you know, two of the things that come to mind and they're pretty short ones is, you know, what is the scaffolding like early on? You know, a, a kid realizing that they have opportunities and maybe walking into a classroom for the first time that they have choice and they, you know, almost get writer's block. I, I, I don't know where to start. I, I don't know what creativity. I, I don't know how to narrow down my options. What would I want to choose? So what is kind of those kind of scaffolds? And the other question I have is how are you grading? Because I know we feel obligated. You know, Ken, you mentioned here are the baselines that you have. When I see that rubric that has, you know, very little, I don't want to say guidelines, but here's the academic content that you're proving, you know, do you feel like you, in that creative process, are they, do they pick up on working smarter and not harder as opposed to the creative opportunity to make something they're actually proud of? Mm-hmm. Nancy, why don't you go ahead and answer the scaffolding first, and then I'll I'll follow up on the scaffolding. Okay. Well, I, you, yeah, choice wise, you just can't make it wide open. You know, you can do these five things. You know, you can do this first, or you can do this first, but you need to get both of these tasks accomplished. Um, you, if you're having children work in stations, you know, you're going to work with in this particular area of the classroom and you can use these materials or these materials. You know, I would just let them have two choices at the time and just you would have to monitor, too, because when you're beginning to to know your students, you don't know yet what they can handle. Some students are like, OK, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this. And you've got other ones that are sitting there. uh you know, which one am I going to do? And you may have to lead, lead them. Well, why don't you start with this one and then try this one? You know, so you're, you get to know which students have at, you know, have any kind of experience with choice. And so you've got to give them those guidelines and kind of scaffold them along, just like you would with a child who doesn't know, you know, a single multiplication fact where you've got this one over here who knows every single one of them. So you've got to look at those behavioral, um, levels of mastery to see what they know. I com I completely agree with that. I think I think differentiation is a part of this. And you know, you have general expectations that a fifth grader or a third grader or a tenth grader should be able to do in terms of making independent decisions. And then when you have students that don't know how to do that, you scaffold them. So in my classroom, part of it was the freedom to sit wherever they wanted whenever they were doing independent work. And I had students that literally could not make that decision without, or could not make a good decision for that. They always sat with their friends and all they did was socialize. I had other students that could sit with their friends and not talk at all. And so it was me sitting down and talking with those students that didn't know how to handle sitting next to their friends. And I, I, it was very simple. I would say, you are social. I don't want you to change that. You're probably going to be a great salesperson one day. You can't sit next to your friend and do your work. All you do is talk. Here is the result. All of this work that was due today, you don't have any of it done. So I, I would let them fail. I would give them that freedom to then see the result. And then I would pull that choice away from them. I would tell them where they have to sit. They would do that for a little while. Then they release back into the wild. And if, sometimes they would make the same poor decision and they'd get put back in the zoo. Or sometimes they would get to remain remain free for a long time. But I think the other piece of that scaffolding, Matt, is forcing your students to make as many decisions as possible throughout the entire day. So their first decision point in your classroom should not be which product for a project. It should be choosing their seats, you know, whether it's the whole day in a flexible classroom or maybe even like during morning time, 
during morning arrival. Let them have free reign of the classroom and make finding opportunities throughout the day where you're constantly forcing them to make decisions. I've said this on the podcast before. Even as simple as in my classroom, there was no snack time. Eat when you're hungry. If you run out of food, that's your fault. Eat your lunch at 10 a.m. in my classroom. I don't care. If you're hungry, eat. But make the decision to make sure you have enough food for the day or you know, eat the right snack at the right time of day. Like Those little things are just opportunities for them to learn how to make decisions and to see that they have the ability to make their own decision. In terms of the... Yeah, just like you... Just like giving them experience in the content, you've got to give them experience in um, in those social skills, which really those right. are what, that's what we're talking right. about. In terms of the rubric, I think the more choice you give, the more overwhelming it can be in terms of grading. So I always had a very simple system. When I would introduce making videos or making a book or recording a podcast or making a poster or slideshow, when we would introduce different uh, media for products, we would develop a set of criteria for that. What is an expectation for a fifth grade student making a video? What is an expectation for a fifth grade student writing a paper? And so we had a standard rubric for that product that carried throughout any time it was ever used. Then for a specific content, there was a content rubric. You need to include, you know, five important dates. You need to include three important people and their impact, whatever it was. They're graded on two rubrics, the product that they choose and that standard rubric that never changes. And then everyone's graded on the same content rubric, regardless of their medium, they have to have this information in their product. And so it doesn't make it more overwhelming because you're still only creating one, one rubric for that project. So almost like process and product. Mm -hmm. A rubric mm -hmm. for each yep. one. Yeah. So I would love to talk about this all night, but I'd also love to transition the conversation slightly. We've gotten to know a lot about your classroom in terms of relationships and, and choice building, but I would love to hear a little bit about your instructional style as well. So Matt, I actually want to, we'll jump in and we'll do the lesson lens. So we can hear about something specific that Nancy has done in her classroom. And then we'll, uh, we'll follow it up with the exit ticket. Sound good? That'll work. All right. So Nancy, the lesson lens is uh, just part of the show where we get to know something you've done in your classroom. So you can kind of take it in the direction that you want, but Matt and I have questions that we'll, we'll ask you back and forth. So the first question is, would you like to tell us about an entire unit, a long-term project, or a single lesson? Um, let me, let's talk about a single lesson. All right. So the clarification, because you, you have a spectrum is, you know, is this specific to a grade level, um, maybe a subject area? And is it specific at all to a certain time of year that you would be teaching it? Well, uh, my passion as far as subject is teaching is science, because I love for students be to be able to experience the science and then to be able to explain it. Um, so one of the things that we've been, that I've been teaching this, this year is that students in fifth grade have to understand is physical change and chemical change. And that is not something that is very interesting to read about you. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty abstract if they haven't had a lot of experience in, in talking about that in school. So we've been doing a lot of cooking. Uh, in the classroom, I had a hot plate that I brought in uh, earlier, or actually, I guess it was last week, and we just boiled water, and we talked about, you know, what's the steam coming out? We used a centigrade thermometer. You know, most of them had never even seen a thermometer uh, with centigrade, so we talked about what that was. We took the temperature of the classroom, looked at the thermometer. We put the, the thermometer in the boiling water, and they recorded it. Another thing that was part of that lesson is this big uh, topic called conservation of matter, which I'll be honest, when I first got into fifth grade, I had to go and study what that actually was and what it looked like. And so, you know, just a simple thing of getting a Ziploc bag, taking it with your partner to the sink, filling it with 50 millimeters of water, zipping it up, measuring it on the gram scales. Oh, it weighs 57 grams. So we talked about 
you know, that gave me an opportunity to talk about what matter actually was and the different forms of it. We took it down the hallway to the teacher's lounge. We put those little Ziploc bags in the freezer and we talked about, hey, it's going to be, you know, ice tomorrow. Is there going to be more mass? Yeah, ice expands. Okay, you know, so it's going to be more than 57 grams tomorrow, you think? Yes. So they were making some, you know, they were making observations, they were making predictions, creating that hypothesis. And lo and behold, when we went down uh, today and got that Ziploc bag and brought it back and waited on the gram scale, it was still the same. And they were like, how come it's still 57 grams? Because we know ice expands. You know, my daddy puts a Coke in the freezer and it bursts and it's it's because it got, you know, it expanded. So we talked about, that gave us that opening uh, to talk about, you know, we can't destroy matter. We can't create matter. Matter is the same, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. And just to talk about that is to me goes over your head and it's hard to recognize that abstract. So I really like to do any time I can do it is do, do something hands-on so they can really see and explain it and understand it themselves uh, because they'll, re they'll remember that. Another thing that we did in the same kind of lesson was we, with my little hot plate, we had a um, beaker that I had put some vinegar in and we had put a balloon on top or had some baking soda in the balloon and they saw the balloon expand. And so they were able to explain, oh, you know, the baking soda is creating that chemical change and what's coming in the balloon is the actual carbon dioxide that normally would go out in the room and we couldn't see. So it's so often I really try, that's just an example of, of that matter lesson of how I really try to get them to experience the science and then come back and explain it because um, I like them to see that phenomenon of what's happening and questioning themselves what is happening and then go back and I teach them the concepts or the vocabulary and then they can use that to help explain what they observed earlier. I love it. You hit on a, a lot of things that I think are important to do in the classroom, that that experience of that phenomena and then teaching, I, I think, is is critical to do as often as possible. So I'm going to combine a couple of our questions here because you answered you answered one of them as well. So you talked about you you talked about what it looks like that the students are actively doing during the lesson and and a little bit of what you were doing during the lesson so if you had to boil down some advice in doing these experimental or do, doing these experiments and this experiential learning especially before you've taught the content what do you think is key for the students to do during that process and what is key in your role during that process as well well, the students, I need to have them in a place in the classroom where they they either have a space to do the, uh, to experience it themselves and they have the materials, or if I'm doing the demonstration, they need to be in a place where they can really see what I'm doing. So if I'm, you know, I make sure I'm not doing something high on the counter, I may sit down on the floor and do it so they can really see um, see the results of, of whatever whatever we're doing there. So they've got to be able to see that. They've got to be able to observe. They have their own uh, uh, science notebook that they actually record. They'll draw what happens. They'll label what's happening. Sometimes I'll just stop after they've done some exploration and I'll just say, okay, do a quick write for two minutes, write down what you observed and what you think is happening. And that helps them, you know, get it out of their head onto paper and to really think about what's going on. One of the things that I do as a teacher is I make sure that I have my materials there and that I've done those explorations myself so I know some of the pitfalls or I know what could or could happen because we know science isn't an exact, you know, doesn't exactly happen the same all the time. You can make predictions from science, but it doesn't always, you know, turn out like you think it might. And and that's okay, too, because as scientists, I teach them um, um you learn from every trial that you do. So let's try that again. What did we do different? What would we, um, or did we see anything we did different the second time that we didn't do the first time? So I really like to engage them in a lot of conversation um, and, and hone those observation skills. So the last question that we have really is the, the, the teacher dream, you know, you're profiling a beautiful lab that, you know, the kids are connecting to, they're visualizing, they're analyzing, you know, that's a beautiful thing. If you were to say, what would be, you know, your goal 
of how you could see that lesson growing even further? Or, you know, how could you make any adjustments to enhance it even further? Um, I would like them to come in in the morning and say, hey, I tried this at home and let me tell you what happened. You know, whether it was cooking in the kitchen, whether it was observing something that they saw outside, um, maybe they saw some frozen ice in their driveway and they run, you know, in a, pu a puddle that had uh, had frozen, or maybe they'd seen um, condensation on the windshield of their car. I'd like them to be able to take what we've talked about in the classroom and recognize, hey, I see that happening in the real world. This is real stuff. So it's not just this is science that I'm learning today from 1 to 2.30 in my classroom, but it's a real thing that happens out here in the world. So we'll sit down when they bring in those examples that they've recognized, and we'll talk about yeah, what was that that happened? And I want them to explain the science of what they saw at their house or what they saw in their, you know, in their real, in their world. So maybe that, that's, that maybe would that's be something that you could incorporate into your morning meeting time too. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and, I, and I think, you know, going back and, and to kind of circle around this, you know, it sounds like Nancy, what you bring that inquiry through the science lesson is also inquiry that you bring into student, you know, centered learning and, and in general, and with science being your, your, you know, uh, heart of teaching, you know, what you love doing the most. It, one of the things it's awesome to see the kids light up and totally connect and, and trying to bring those other attributes into the ELA classroom or into that math classroom is definitely a little bit more challenging, but it still has a place. So it's trying to figure out how you bring that curiosity and the connection and, you know, the real world attributes of, you know, what we're doing and how, how it can solve problems, I think, um, can bring some of the benefits of teaching science to other subject areas. Yeah, I mean, that's the hardest part I do. It's one thing to understand what the what the um, standards are and what what they need to know at the end. It's another thing to know, okay, how can I bring that to life in the classroom? And that's really where I spend a lot of my time is trying to figure out how can I help them see this or how can I help them experience it, this? What will bring it to a level where they can actually understand that abstract concept? And, but that's fun to me. I mean, it is the hardest part of what I do, but that's the creative part and what I love. Well, I think that, that generalization, we, that, that's what we kind of talk about it, right? Like, you know, if we're talking about life cycle of a frog, you know, and, you know, the assessment is not about the life cycle, cycle of the frog, hopefully they can generalize what they learned from that scenario to whatever is the profile that they're learning about. And I think that's where we sometimes get hung up looking at assessment anchors and standards and those type features. Anytime we can encourage teachers and, and create an experience in our classroom where the students discover something first before they hear a vocabulary term is so, so important. And having a more, more of a thorough understanding of why things happen and why these principles are there and not just teaching them this is the rule. This is how you solve it. This is how you do it. So, you know, two big things that I, I actually did more when I, when I was tutoring because these were concepts beyond fifth grade, but I did a lot of middle school and high school math tutoring when students would learn something as simple as when you multiply two variables with exponents, you add the exponents together. Well, I would have this, I would have the kids I work with come up with random numbers, 13 squared times, you know, 12 to the fifth. And then have them figure out that if you do 13 times 13 times 12 times 12, 12, 12 that many times you get the same answer. Getting them to see the pattern, to understand that you add those exponents instead of just teaching them, you add the exponents. So having kids, you know, experience these phenomena, like you said, I think are so important. You still do all the teaching. You just do that second. Give them the experience first. It's a lot easier for students to connect vocab to a phenomena versus trying to, to connect vocab to just a, an example that you're giving them that they, they haven't experienced. Well, and yeah, when I first started out and, and even in ELA classes, I would teach the vocabulary first. I didn't know any better. Um, and then, you know, I began to think more and more and reflect on my teaching and think, you know, 
they don't even understand what these words mean. I mean, we can talk about what they mean, but they're not making that connection. And so through the reflection that I did, I thought, okay, this is not working. And it was not as interesting to me thinking back. It wasn't an, as interesting to experience that lesson as a teacher as it is to me now, because I like to see them twist and turn and think and turn to a partner and talk about what they see and then get excited and try to explain what it is without knowing the words. So then when we go back and talk about the, that, that vocabulary, it automatically, they have a connection for it and can start to use it immediately. Yeah. I love it. I absolutely love it. All right. Let's uh, jump into our exit ticket. Same four questions we ask every guest every week. Question number one, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? Um, I think that they can make it an enjoyable place and just m help that student recognize that teacher is, or that I'm very happy they're there today and tomorrow and the next day. Just make them feel welcome. I'm so glad you're here. So I, I, I am very excited about this one. What is the best piece of advice that you feel like you've received that you think about frequently? And it could have been, you know, from a colleague, uh, maybe a supervisor, or even a student you think of um, related to, you know, motivation and teaching. Um, I kind of alluded to it just a minute ago. It was, it was what was going through my mind. If I'm not enjoying my classroom, my children are not enjoying the classroom because they're feeling the same thing I'm feeling. And so if the learning is not interesting, if they're not engaged, if I'm doing some things that, that are not as, as interesting as they could be to me, then they're definitely not to the children. And so I need to make a change. So that was a great piece of advice I got from a teacher. If you don't like it, they probably don't either. <laughs> Well, this may tap into it or it may not. You know, the follow up is really that we recognize that the school year goes in waves of, you know, things are great. You know, we're flying high at the beginning of the school year. You know, uh, it may dip below around report cards or parent teacher conferences or whatever the case may be. But, you know, we have these ebbs and flows of the positive highs and, and the, the challenges in the school year. What do you think of or what do you feel like educators need to hear to help power up through those moments of struggle? I think they need a colleague that they can go to and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Do you have any advice or has this happened to you before? Because I think understanding that you're not the only person that that you that is experiencing that. Uh, sometimes teaching can be a lonely profession because you're in a classroom with all those uh, younger students, whether they're five or whether they're 15. And you need to understand that probably something that you're experiencing, someone else has experienced it too. And you just may need um, somebody to step back and be a little bit objective about it or to give you some advice of what worked for them or what didn't work for them and kind of almost like take a recheck. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Let me go back and try something different. But sometimes you just need to step away from that and think what needs to change. Even if it's, even if you're kind of, you know, not necessarily anything bad, even if you're kind of in a rut and you think, okay, this needs to be better, but I don't know exactly which approach to go. I think you do need a, a safe group of people, two or three that you can go to and they, they will be objective with you. I love it. Absolutely love it. It's easy to fall into facilitating a repetitive classroom. What do you think separates the teachers who are constantly seeking to change, innovate, and implement new teaching strategies in their classroom? I think it's a passion for learning themselves, that they are themselves a learner and they want to learn more uh, about not only the content, but about their craft of teaching and that they're always seeking uh, to, um, to improve themselves. So I, I think it's a, it's an inborn passion for that. I think that definitely is, is accurate. So, I mean, I, I know I can speak for Ken. We feel privileged to have you for this episode. And I know I've appreciated hearing so much of what you've shared. What is a way that our audience can continue to connect and, and learn from you going forward, whether that's website or social media? Um, I am a big Twitter person. 
So uh, I tweet a lot of what I do in my in my classroom, some of the successes we have, some of the um, special projects that we're doing. So I am at Miles, N-A-W Miles on Twitter. So I would love to hear uh, from folks who uh, are doing some innovative things in their classroom, especially in science. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is this has been a blast, Nancy. I, Thanks, I, I've guys. absolutely loved it. Um, I'm really, really glad that Morgan recommended that we, uh, we have you come in and join us. This has been a, it's yeah, been a great conversation great. and I just want to say thank you on behalf of your students, on behalf of teachers for just doing what you do in education, because, uh, we can't have enough positive, effective and great teachers that we, that we have, um, in our, in our country and really in the world. So, so thank you so much. I know your, your district is very lucky to have you. So. Well, I appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys having this podcast because I think we get so many negatives in the news about teaching. I think it's a great platform for us to be able to share the great things that are going on in education. So thanks for, for keeping it going. Thank you very much. Uh, you can follow us on right. social media, myself at Ken Ehrman. You can follow Matt at EdTech Neighbor and the show at Power edu up so make sure that you follow along with us on twitter as well as nancy um, and you can also uh, make sure that you subscribe to this podcast if you have not so you can continue to hear the amazing guests that we get to talk to each and every week so nancy thank you again and matt why don't you take us on out of here it's been a pleasure thank you bye guys as we power down this episode nancy you left us powered up we appreciate it and we'll talk to you next week Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to or watching us on YouTube. Each week we get to talk to amazing educators. We're making a positive impact on the lives of students, their colleagues, administrators, and education as a whole. It's been such a privilege every week to be able to talk to these incredible individuals, learn from them, grow with them, and better myself and all of education through these conversations. If you haven't already, please consider sharing this with a colleague, someone who can benefit and be powered up from the experience of listening to these incredible conversations. Because of Powered Up, we are powering education by empowering you.